My name is John Kessler. I call myself a sculptor, but clearly under a kind of maybe like branch of sculpture that is kinetic. I often work in the same way, no matter what material it is. I start with a found object and I invoke a sculptural practice to that object. My dad had a workshop in the basement, which was a kind of bricoleur's workshop, you know, fix it man kind of thing. And I used to go down there and just make stuff. But it was kind of like my laboratory, my research lab. All through high school, uh, I did a lot of drugs and was in a rock band and did art. But even though I took art classes, I didn't really have a portfolio to speak of. So when I applied to art schools, I got rejected everywhere. And then my mom actually knew someone who was teaching at SUNY Purchase, and it was a brand new school. And they were looking for students, which was good for me. So I got into that school, and uh, that's where I ended up going for two years. And then I actually left for two years. I went hitchhiking around Africa for a year, and hitchhiking around Europe, getting odd jobs along the way. And I would go to marketplaces and just hang out at the market and watch people repair things. I saw people turning, you know, like rubber tires from trucks into sandals or the things that we sort of know, like these toys that are made out of cans. And I would watch these objects get transformed. And that really informed my work. Then I ended up going back to art school, graduated in 1980. Hi. Welcome to the studio. Uh, this is my studio where I've been since 1980, and my landlord never could imagine that anyone would want to live in a factory. For the last year, I've been working on works that are really sort of Calder-inspired. Stabile, which is his term for a piece that's not a mobile. Everything has a sort of a balance point, and there's an equilibrium. I've been using a lot of stainless steel with this work, which is going to get polished to a very high uh, mirror polish. And then there's German porcelain, which are going to be reglazed. So it's sort of like ugly beautiful. It's all found objects. It probably is no surprise that after working with motors for 35 years and thinking that I wasn't going to motorize any of these works, I stuck a motor in this one. There's a lot of nests in the work and, the, and nests of course are about birth, but there's a lot of times in the nest, it's kind of horrible what's happening in there. They're broken eggs. So that's a contradiction that I want the work to have in it. This is probably the biggest work so far. It's a nest, obviously, um, and it's not going to be this can, but it's a little complicated in the sense that it's got two fulcrums. There's two points of balance. And this is sort of how I work, where things just get cable tied together as a temporary until I figure out the weight and then um, things get formalized later. Finding this material takes the onus off of me having to do the casting and figure out well, what do I want to cast. So I find these found objects and then I put them together. For me, the found object is very important, not just because of its history, you know, post Duchamp, but I love the fact that these things are imbued with someone else's DNA or someone else's history. It's like a secret inner life that these objects have, and that for me is always something that interests me about the found object. What I'm trying to do in a lot of the work is have these sort of like large gestures that are balanced with small, precise very emotional moments. And that gives the pieces an emotional weight. Um, and that gives them, you know, kind of something that's very close to our lives, which is the large gestures and the things that are sort of the small things. In 1994, I had a kid and I had no security. I had no health insurance. I had no, it was feast or famine. Sometimes I'd make money from my work, other times not. And I realized I needed some security. I needed a job for the first time in my life. Um, and so I ran into a friend, Judy Pfaff, 
And Judy said, I said, do you know of any teaching jobs? And she said, yeah, mine. I just quit Columbia. And so I applied to Columbia and miraculously they gave it to me. For the first couple of years, I wasn't a good teacher. I was selfish and just wanted to get back to my studio and kind of probably resentful of the fact that I had a job. And then I got good at it and I realized that the more you give, the more you get. And the more you invest, the more you receive. And so then I was asked to be the chair of the program of Columbia. And at that point, I realized at that, at that point, my career was kind of had tanked. I wasn't really even coming to the studio. I realized I might as well be the chair of the program, go up there five days a week and do that. And so I did that for five years and kind of reinvigorated or restart. I, I, I completely changed the curriculum and, and was good at it. And somehow the confidence in doing that well spilled over into my artwork. And I would come to the studio and that's after 9-11, I started getting these ideas for these surveillance pieces and started getting my career back and getting my work again. My family and I, we were living in Tribeca, and we were, my daughter was in school in uh, 234, which is a block from the World Trade Center. Our neighborhood became a kind of a war zone. And the image that I couldn't get out of my head that I was really sort of spooked by was what the terrorists would have seen in the cockpit. In order to exercise this image from my head, I decided to make it. So I took postcards of the World Trade Center, put them on a machine. It's a conveyor belt system that is similar to one hour photo developing machine. And then I took a small surveillance camera and that was the first time I put a camera in my work. And so what happens is the postcards come to the camera and then there's a monitor. And in the monitor, it looks like you're going right into the building. And that became a piece called one hour photo. And that was the beginning of all this work for years. I was obsessed with Homeland Security and, and surveillance and the Patriot Act and the war in Iraq. And it generated a lot of work for, you know, this sort of the piss and vinegar of my anger and my, my politics. The world outside is so dire right now. And it's so horrible and it's so toxic that I would come to the studio and I really needed to close off from that. And so I started working with these pieces that are behind me as a way of dealing with it less didactically, less directly, and more metaphorically. And I wanted to make pieces that were not so directly responding to the politics that are amongst us right now, while still addressing certain important issues that I've, especially the environment. Some of these works are meant to evoke current events in terms of ecologies and climate change, but they're mostly really about the precariousness of life. So they're all balanced and they're all fragile. This is a piece called Fiji. Fiji water is probably the most absurd in the sense that a tremendous amount of energy is used to get the water here. This sort of almost like rock formation, it's called slag. This stuff generally gets given or sold to a junk dealer. This is one of the most beautiful, I think, found objects that I found in the garbage pail of a foundry. And that's just a Fiji bottle that's filled with gallium meant to look like mercury. I think this work is less overtly political than the work, let's say, that I showed in the biennial a year ago. Yet it's here. It's almost impossible for me to sort of remove those urgencies. This work is probably the only piece that really has the sort of the contrast of the highly polished stainless steel to bronze relationship. This is called Venus. It's a found object from China. Obviously, you know, this relationship of the, from the Botticelli painting. But the reef is kind of becoming metallic and dead, you know, and that's what's happening to the coral reefs. They're dying. My first show was in 1983, and that show had lots of found objects. Back then, if I had an idea for something, I'd have to scour flea markets or go to garage sales. And it would, might take a year to find what I was looking for. And now, I just type in exactly what I'm looking for, and bingo, I've got like hundreds of options. So eBay has really, truly changed my work. A lot of these works are called Ikebana. Ikebana is the art of Japanese flower arrangement. And I have spent a lot of time studying certain aspects of Japanese culture. I went to Japan, took flower arranging classes. And so there's a sort of obvious balance that's happening here, but also a kind of dynamic equilibrium. They're meant to keep you excited. It's not about just symmetry. It's about cantilever, about expression, about a kind of poetry through form. 
I wanted all these curves to be very deliberate and spikiness and then in relationship to these other pieces. This is one of my favorite pieces I've done. This, so this is a found object I got on eBay. The search was for Ikebana vases. So I bought one and um, immediately started, you know, like turning it into my work. The part of my brain that, you know, figures things out, which was, you know, all the mechanical work that I've been doing for so many years, is exercised here and needed. And then the sort of playfulness that happens when the parts come together. The only things I was good at when I was a kid were art and music. And I took guitar lessons when I was really young. And then I left it for a while. And then in high school, I realized that was a way of picking up girls. And so I started playing guitar again and was in a rock band. And it's very different from what happens here. You know, as an artist, it's only when you take the works out of here and go and do a show that you feel there's any kind of response. But when you're playing music, it's this immediate response and you know if you're playing well, you kind of just like have this exchange that's immediate. There was a period where I didn't show my work from 1994 to 2004. At the end of that period, I, I made this figure kind of like an aging hippie waking up on the beach of Venice, California with a bottle of cheap wine in my hand. And so he became a kind of avatar or surrogate for me in my work. He also became a kind of a homeless figure or a terrorist figure. And uh, he became my hippie homeless terrorist dude who was just very vital to the work I was doing in the Palace of 4AM especially. And then a work called Kessler Circus um, that would, I showed at Deitch Projects. And then after that, a piece called The Web. For me, there's a difference between work that is speaking to anxiety and work that is anxiety producing. And I feel like a lot of my big installations, and I adore them, and I'm really glad I made them. And I, you know, I'm actually going to Hamburg to see the Palace at 4 a.m., which is being completely renovated. They put $100,000 into changing all the televisions, and I can't wait to see it. But it's anxiety producing. It's really about, you know, it's. It's about war. It's about the war in Iraq, and it's about, you know, our completely bogus entry into that country. You don't retire as an artist. We're chained to this profession. It's not like we're 65 and it's time to go to Miami. This is it. You know, we do this till we die. I don't make a lot of work. It really is like a laboratory, you know. I have successes, but I have a lot of failures, and the failures are really important. I'll just keep pushing, keep pushing until it's right. And it could be the smallest little change that I make that all of a sudden clicks and it's just like, poop, you know, it's, it's right.